Timothy tonight. So um, if you would grab your Bibles and go to Titus chapter 1 this evening. That's where we're going to be jumping in and studying Titus chapter 1. I hope that you remember from last week's study, uh, verses 5 through 8 that we covered, that we were talking about the qualifications for elders. And in that, we looked at two particular headings, that elders must be exemplary in their home lives, and elders must be exemplary in their personal character. And today we go really into the third um, line of thought in the qualifications, and we're going to talk about uh, they must be exemplary in their doctrine, right? So this is part two of qualifications for elders. Titus chapter 1, to catch all the context, or as much as we, as we can, we're going to begin in verse 5. Remember that Paul is writing, he's writing to Titus, who was one of his partners in ministry, one of the young men that he had personally seemingly won to the Lord and had discipled and now uh, utilized him in a couple of critical ministries, both in Corinth and on the island of Crete now. So he says in verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, that kind of encapsulated that first point, right? That a, an elder must be exemplary in their home life. They need to be blameless in these particular areas, in their marriage and in their um, child training. And then he says, uh, going on, for a, bus a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. And then this is our focus for tonight, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Let me emphasize something here. This is not really a, a significant part of our study tonight, but you can see a very natural progression, much like we see in 1 Timothy, uh, or 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, where he says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There was a responsibility in Timothy's life, just as there's a responsibility on Titus as having been a hearer of the word of God to faithfully take what he had been taught and to pass it on to others. And so we have a dual responsibility. Our primary focus tonight is going to be the responsibility laid upon elders or mature men that are conveying that truth, but don't miss the, the other side of the coin. At one point in time, Titus had been the receiver of that truth. And because he had received the faithful word of God and he had made application of it, um, he was obedient to it. Now he had matured to a point where he could repeat that process himself. So once again, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. I doubt that there has ever been a time since Jesus Christ started his church that the enemy has not in some way or another been significantly attacking the word of God. There have been violent attacks that you can see from church history that have come from outside of churches. There have been insidious attacks from within through false doctrine and through traditions that have undermined the scriptures. Now, according to the promise of Jesus Christ, he founded his churches during his personal ministry, and they would continue to exist throughout all ages as, as witnesses of truth until he returned, until he comes again. That has been the witness of history, though the attacks have continued throughout all those ages. Though the truth, though, has still been around and pure churches continued to exist and proclaim it, some time periods that you can look at in the history of the world have been far darker than others. And we live in an interesting time even today. But to back up just a bit and talk a, a bit of history during the Middle Ages, during the height of Catholicism's power, most, if not all, of their priests and their leaders, those that they would call their elders in the Catholic Church, were ignorant of even the most basic teachings of the Bible. Since the Bible wasn't translated into the common languages, only the priests were educated enough to be able to read it. 
It was kept in Latin intentionally so that the common people couldn't read it. Uh, so only the priests could read it and teach it, but few of them ever did. They relied completely on church doctrine and, uh, and whatever they were told uh, from their higher-ups. And the Reformation largely took place because the Bible began to be translated into the common tongues, which when read brought great conviction to the souls of many people who'd been kept in darkness by their purported spiritual leaders. Droves of people during that time exited Catholicism as they simply realized the truth from the Bible. And they were led to get out of that satanic institution. Now, of course, we understand that even the Protestant leaders and most of those who led the Reformation were mostly Catholic priests who just protested out of Catholicism. They were darkened men themselves who started their own religions with no more authority than the Catholic Church had. In many cases, they severely persecuted pure churches. Many of our Baptist forefathers experienced more intense persecution from the Protestants than they did Catholicism. But, um, but what little impact those, even those darkened teachers made that came out of Catholicism, the little impact that they may have had was because they began to turn away from religious tradition and point people to the scriptures as their authority. Now, of course, uh, if you've read about the Reformation at all, you should know that their battle cry was sola scriptura, right? Scripture alone. They, they weren't really true to that, but at least that's what they pointed people to. And there were many of the common people that did follow that, uh, that philosophy. During that time, the scriptures were translated into the common European tongues so that the common people could read them. And that continued to result in masses of people exiting Catholicism and exiting Protestantism as they comprehended and they applied the scriptures to their everyday lives genuinely changed because of that. Many of those folks came into fellowship of pure churches once they believed the gospel, and they weren't just reformed from corrupt religions. They were truly made new creatures in Christ as they believed the gospel. They placed themselves under the leadership of godly elders in scriptural churches, and over the course of the next uh, number of years, England... And many European countries moved from total biblical ignorance to being uh, ground zero for missionary activity across the world. Now, that's the power of the scriptures. Folks, we should love the Bible. We should treasure the Bible. We should live in accordance with the Bible, teach the Bible, fight for the Bible, die for the Bible if necessary. It's God's living word. It's more important than anything else in this world. And God has assigned his churches the very special and unique task of being the pillar and the ground of the truth. We're the re repository of God's word. We must preserve its integrity at all costs. And there are some very special means by which God does that in local churches. It's going to be a bit of the subject of our study tonight. As we come forward into more recent days... Fast-forwarding hundreds of years, attacks have come into churches uh, in many other ways. Seminaries have been notorious for compromising the Word of God. By the way, that shouldn't come as a shock to anybody because seminaries are not God's appointed repository of preserving truth. They're not His designated guardians of the truth. Churches are. Today we have uh, seen over the past several generations a number of movements that have undermined and plucked down the authority of scriptures and pure doctrine in many churches. Uh, some of the movements that I'll just briefly talk about. Evangelicalism, the seeker church movement, the emerging church movement, the progressive church movement. Those are just a few of the more recent developments of the same old ways of casting doubt on the word of God lowering biblical standards of truth, watering down Bible doctrine in favor of blending everybody together despite what the scriptures teach. Evangelicalism has been around since at least the early 1700s. It is, uh, it, it is a self-proclaimed worldwide trans-denominational movement that emphasizes that the gospel is ultimately all that really matters and no one should really divide over other doctrines. 
They divide Bible doctrines into what they call primary doctrines, which would be the gospel, and secondary doctrines, claiming that the secondary ones aren't really all that important, even though they're found in the pages of Scripture. They historically claim to have high regard for Scripture. That's one of their taglines for themselves. But that's really undermined by their attempt to rank the doctrines um, into categories of what should be stood for and what shouldn't be stood for. Uh, personally, I just find it appropriate to recognize that God gave us this word and it's all important and should be stood for. <laughs> it should all be received by faith and obeyed. Some well-known leaders of the evangelical movement in history have included John Wesley, George Whitefield, Jonathan Edwards, D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, uh, Bill Bright, Harold Okanga, John Stott, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Those are some big names over the past centuries that have been very active proponents of this dissolve the denominational barriers, focus only on the gospel, and compromise on everything else. Today's evangelicals who practice exactly the same things, are fellows such as Rick Warren, Jim Dobson, Franklin Graham, Ted Haggard, Bill Hybels, T.D. Jakes, Tim and Beverly LaHaye, Joyce Meyer, J.I. Packer, Rick Santorum, Jay Seculo, and others. I could go on and on. Now, those folks that I just mentioned, although they're a very small cross-section of this evangelical movement, they tend to be elevated and highly respected by many well-meaning but ignorant folks. They are apostate. They don't receive the Bible. Now, the seeker church movement really took off during my teen years. I can still remember it very plainly. It was a movement that was brought into the spotlight by Rick Warren and his book, The Purpose Driven Church. How many people have heard of that book? Yeah, how many people have read it? Well, I pity you, all right? There's, a, there's not a whole lot to be found in there other than just to be able to clearly see the, the deviation from Scripture. Let me give you a quick synopsis of that. Not the book, but the movement. Followers of the seeker church movement state that their goal is to reach unchurched seekers amongst the lost and bring them to faith in Christ. That might seem like a great motive, a great goal, other than the fact that the scriptures plainly say there is none that seeketh after God. Um, there's a specific way that God has to bring uh, salvation to people. And the entire concept that somehow people have got this empty vagueness in their life that they just need a, they have this God-shaped hole in their soul or something like that, right? That, that just needs to be filled and only God can fit. And everybody just knows that and they're looking for God. That's completely antithetical to what the Bible teaches. It teaches that the human heart is corrupt. They're all gone out of the way. They've sought to their own way. They hate God, right? Well, at the heart of the strategy of the seeker movement, is the redesigning of evangelism concepts. They've moved away from God's ordained method of saving people through the clear preaching of the gospel. By the way, I would point you back to Titus. I will get to our text in a minute. Titus chapter 1 and verse 3. It says that, that God hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. That's how God's made his truth known. He did it then. That's how he does it now. Uh, but anyway, they've moved away from God's ordained method of saving people through the clear preaching of the gospel. And then rather than maturing and equipping God's people for the work of the ministry, they don't want to offend. So they redesign their approach. The gospel offends people. You tell people that they're uh, described in the Bible as being a leper, a corrupt, diseased hell-bound individual with nothing good about them. That doesn't generally go over real well with most people today. And so they don't want to offend. They redesign their approach. The tagline is, come as you are and leave as you are. At least that's the outcome. They've redesigned their church services so that it's aimed primarily at this target audience. By the way, I would emphasize that while our objective is to take the gospel to every creature, we don't meet together in this assembly time 
for evangelism so much as we do for equipping the saints for the work of the ministry so we can go out and win people to Jesus Christ. And so that's been totally done away with. So now you have this, this uh, approach to just target this particular audience of lost people. Thus, biblically rich hymns have been replaced with rock music and shallow lyrics that don't say anything about sin or about Jesus Christ. Colored stage lighting and fog machines and big screen TVs give the auditoriums a non-threatening movie theater feel. The lights dim down so nobody has to even be seen as they blend into the audience. Dress standards have totally disappeared to the extent that um, there's not just an effort to keep guests comfortable, but the leaders and the church members alike dress and look just like the pagans that they're trying to reach. They often use drama in their services. The services are kept extremely short, especially the preaching. Believers are actually discouraged from bringing their Bibles to church because that would threaten the unchurched. Sermons are short. They're almost always topical self-help talks about how to succeed in life. If you think that I'm joking, just turn on a, a few of them on TV. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. One church growth writer stated that if you want your church to grow, you should not ever preach on anything controversial or negative. And so lost people pack these meetings. And as you might expect, the only change that occurs is the elimination of any quality from those who claim to be God's people. Now, the emergent church movement finds the seeker church too big, too glitzy, too program-driven, and they want to emphasize building close relationships, which, of course, we understand is a good thing, but they buy into the flawed philosophy of what's called postmodernism, which denies that there is such a thing as absolute truth in the moral or the spiritual realm. Experience is emphasized over doctrine. Tolerance and acceptance are key virtues in this movement, with no distinctions drawn between truth and error. To have a pastor stand up each week and tell everybody how they should live, even if it's based in the Bible, is viewed as arrogant and judgmental and inappropriate. And so doctrine is greatly de-emphasized. I'm trying to picture for you an evolution that's taken place in Western culture from the early 1700s and how it's naturally progressed. Evolving from all of those, several other movements have formed in recent years, including what's called the progressive Christianity movement and liberal Christianity. They're largely characterized by questioning, such, uh, uh, questioning matters such as human diversity, a strong emphasis on social justice, care for the poor and the oppressed, and environmental stewardship of the earth. That's kind of where we've arrived at today, if you look at what uh, the media at least touts as being churches um, that are Christian in our society. They primarily emphasize Jesus teaching to love one another. Everybody love one another. That leads them to a focus on producing social causes like social justice, mercy, tolerance, often political activism. They heavily lean on liberalism, on postmodernism. That is the teaching, again, there's no absolute truth on social justice. And one of the biggest and most recent critical pieces that's been pushed to the forefront is feminism that has permeated and overrun the culture and the church cultures as well. Now, if you were to visit the websites of any of these modern groups or go in person and ask, you'd find that most of them don't even have a doctrinal statement anymore. If they do, at best it's so generic and nondescript that nobody could possibly disagree with it. At worst, they won't even share anything at all about what they believe. I shared this a while back, but last year out of a desire to just speak in an informed manner about other churches in our area, I contacted every so-called independent Baptist church in the Fairbanks and North Pole area, and I asked them, hey, can you guys send me your doctrinal statement? Would you believe that I was met with suspicion or no response from, all, uh, from almost every single one of them? Just kind of mind-boggling to me. Um, there was one church that had it posted on their website, 
and only one that I contacted that was actually willing to provide me with a doctrinal statement. I told him who I was. I was like, I'm just a pastor from across town here at this other church. I personally can't figure out why one of Jesus' churches wouldn't be totally transparent about their doctrine. Unless they're trying not to offend people because they're scared that doctrine divides and drives people away. Well, I mentioned all of that uh, to introduce our text. This verse, verse 9, is a verse which, if followed, would anchor churches carefully to the authority of the word of God. Paul says in verse 9 that an elder must be a man holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. I love that verse. It's fantastic. The fact is, Everybody holds to doctrine. Everybody holds to some kind of doctrine. The question is whether they hold to biblically sound doctrine. Now, this is a critically serious matter. Wherever doctrine departs from Scripture, a person worships their own homemade God. And so all need to grow in understanding sound Bible doctrine so that we can honor and serve God faithfully. The role of elders, which we're really dialing into, is to know Scripture well enough that they are able to safeguard a church body with sound doctrine, uh, sound doctrine as Satan repeatedly attempts over and over and over again to introduce error into a church. It happens on a continual basis. There are constant assaults that take place throughout a church's history. And so Paul says this, elders must be godly men who steadfastly hold to and boldly teach Bible doctrine. Now, Paul gives five requirements for faithful elders with regards to God's word here. I'm going to march through them pretty quickly. First of all, elders must be men of solid biblical understanding. Remember, we are to be constantly evaluating in this church body or in any church body, if we're doing what Titus teaches us, we're to be constantly evaluating all of our men for appointment to this office. If we're discipling the way that we should be, all of God's people should be trained and highly competent in their handling of Scripture. This qualification of all of them should be totally squared away in a healthy church ministry. Now, of course, um, we've also seen that if we're training folks and if they're serving properly, all of the spiritual gifts within a church body relate in some way to the skillful communication of God's truth as well. There ought to be nobody in the church body that's just a weakling when it comes to their understanding of Bible doctrine. One way in which uh, that that uh, truth is conveyed clearly is through teaching. Now, particularly for this office, for the office of elder, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 3, 2, that elders must be apt to teach. That is a qualification. The word apt means able. They are capable of teaching. And, uh, and as our text states here, an elder must be able by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. The teaching, the exhorting, the convincing is done, folks, with the word of God. With a solid basis of understanding in the word of God, one cannot convince gainsayers if they don't clearly know the word themselves and have the capability to communicate it. Now, I'm not saying that, um, that all elders must have the spiritual gift of teaching, um, God delivers different gifts and abilities to his people as he sees fit. The simple reality is that men who will occupy this office must have biblical understanding so that they are able to communicate God's word effectively to believers and unbelievers alike. That's all wrapped up in this statement in this verse. Every elder must be knowledgeable enough in scripture that he can instruct believers and can correct doctrinal error when he encounters it. The office itself demands this. The function of oversight that we talked about a few weeks ago provides protection to a church body from error and from attack from without, and it guides the flock from within. The function of shepherding, the very function of it, is to feed the flock with good understanding. 
Now, even though preaching or teaching may not be an elder's specific spiritual gift, every elder must be pouring himself into studying and deepening his understanding of God's word. To hold fast the faithful word, one must understand it. Simply put, to understand it, one must study it. (laughs) Studying is a lifelong endeavor. I learn something new every time I prepare to come here and preach. It's really remarkable. It's one of the most exciting things about studying. And so I would say that if a man doesn't have a desire to read and to study God's word diligently so that he understands sound doctrine, he obviously shouldn't be an elder. May not even be saved. And those who don't work hard at preaching and teaching and exhortation certainly shouldn't be elders. So, first of all, elders must be men of solid biblical understanding. That's the first inference that we draw from that. Secondly, elders must be men of biblical conviction. Conviction is an important word to understand. Holding fast is the phrase here. That means to cling to something. To be devoted completely to something. Totally given over to it. It suggests steadfastness and stability in one's life. In one's understanding. In one's belief of truth. It's not just a matter of study and arrival at certain conclusions. But it's a matter of being firmly established in those conclusions. Because they are from the word of God. And standing upon them no matter what comes. Now, such strong convictions flow out of having done proper study. The more you study sound doctrine from the scriptures, the more you appreciate God's grace as it's shown in the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you study sound doctrine, the more you understand why the doctrines of the Bible are so essential. The more you study sound doctrine, the more you begin to see how the enemy has subtly introduced destructive heresies that have damaged people's lives and ruined them eternally. You begin to understand how and why men have been willing to die torturous deaths rather than deny those truths. That's not something we really have to endure today, but throughout history it's been the case that strengthens your own convictions as you recognize that to firmly hold to truth even in the face of strong pressure to compromise. I was recently reading accounts of many who paid the ultimate price because of their convictions. Fox's Book of Martyrs describes the torture and the execution often by being burned alive of men, women, And children who refused to deny the gospel and who refused to deny other Bible doctrines. John Bunyan, very well known man, writer. If he simply agreed to quit preaching God's word without their approval, He would be released almost immediately, but he refused to violate his biblical convictions. It's easy for us to distance ourselves from that and maybe the pain and the difficulty that that might cause. But let me tell you another twist to that story. John Bunyan had an inseparable bond with his oldest daughter. His little girl was was born blind. Not exactly a very uh, respectable life to lead in those days. Her mother had died. She was nine years old when Bunyan was thrown into prison and unable to care for her. He said that the anguish of being unable to care for her was like someone was tearing the flesh from his bones with hot pinchers. The months of his imprisonment turned into years. And he wrote how she would beg and scrounge 
to come up with a small jug of soup and then would feel her way to the prison to deliver it to him each day to keep him alive. His little girl Mary got sick and she died at 13 years old before Bunyan was ever released. Now I want to tell you, there's not much of a higher price to pay than something like that. But he was a man who understood that he couldn't lay aside convictions from the truth of God's word. Now, I will say this, we're talking about having convictions and that's something that you're willing to die for. We need to temper this point. By the way, John Bunyan did die before it was over with in prison during a second imprisonment. But we need to temper this point about holding to convictions with a bit of caution. We have to be firm, or we ought to be firm and unwavering on God's truth, undeniably, not um, on traditions and not on opinions. It must be founded on God's truth. If you want to fight for something, fight for God's word. Don't fight for other stuff. We also need wisdom and discernment about where and when to contend for the faith. There are plenty of times that the New Testament instructs us when it's appropriate to do so. And there's times when it's not profitable and confront, confrontation is to be avoided according to Scripture. And it's not that doctrine isn't always worth contending for. But in some cases, the person being addressed obstinately refuses to hear and it's a waste of time. We also are instructed in the scripture that we need to contend for the truth in love. Now, folks, um, this is a critical thing to understand. We must not love controversy. We must not love debating. Rather, we must love God and love his truth above all. And we must love people, including those who are in error. False teaching is cruel because it damages people. Sometimes our manner of presenting truth can also damage and undo the very work that we're seeking to accomplish. The scriptures command that we must be speaking the truth in love. And so there is, there is a, a tempering of that standing for conviction, at least the way that we do it. There's one writer who spoke of Paul this way and said that Paul provides us a wonderful example in his New Testament writings. This is what he said of him. He labors to set the churches straight on numerous issues, including quite a few issues that don't in themselves even involve heresy. <laughs> he doesn't exclude controversy from his pastoral writings. He doesn't hold back on engaging in controversy whenever heresy threatens Bible doctrine. He's like a parent to his churches. Parents don't just correct and discipline their children for felonies. Good parents help their children grow up in kindness and courtesy to mature adulthood. And since the fabric of truth is seamless, Paul knows that letting minor strands go on unraveling can eventually rend the whole garment. Well, um, love deals with error, and it strives for the highest good of its object. It must show itself by standing for truth that will salvage the person that it addresses and it must do so in a loving manner. And so elders must be men of biblical understanding and they must be men of biblical conviction. I hope that you can draw the, the dots here, connect the dots to see all of God's people should be doing those things. And by the way, we emphasized last week that of these qualifications that we're looking at, while they're mandatory for a person to be appointed to an office, all of God's people should be qualifying for these matters. Um, and so thirdly, elders must be men of biblical obedience. Now, it would be sheer hypocrisy, which the Bible strongly condemns, to exhort people to follow God's word and yet not to follow it yourself. Paul goes on to expose the false teachers in verse 16. We'll get there in the next couple of weeks, but it says this, that they profess that they know God. Notice these words. Look at the hypocrisy that comes through this. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Confession of knowing God or believing truth isn't the be-all and end-all of Christianity. Obedience to him is. There is one man that put it this way as far as um, addressing elders and their need to not be hypocritical and to be obedient to Scripture. He said, it would be better if they broke their necks while mounting the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> 
than to be unwilling to be the first to walk after God, demonstrating that they are sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ's flock themselves. <laughs> now, of course, we understand that no one lives in a state of sinless perfection, but as we saw in verses 6 and 7, an elder must be blameless. He can't be two-faced. He can't be a hypocrite. He can't live one way at church and live another way at home or out in the community. He can't harbor secret sins or be living a double standard. He can't preach the word and fail to live the word. Elders must be men of biblical obedience. Number four, elders should be men of biblical exhortation. They must be able by sound doctrine to exhort. The word sound is a great word here. It comes from the Greek word um, hugiaano. Um, if you actually look at the, at the spelling of it, it's almost the word hygiene. And we actually get our word hygiene from it or hygienic from it. Um, it means to be healthy. Sound doctrine aims at and results in spiritual health. It results in spiritual maturity. If you want to know whether you're believing in and practicing sound doctrine, just examine your life as far as spiritual maturity and see if you're getting there or not. Now, there's a growth process that everybody goes through, but, uh, but it should be very clear, very measurable as the scriptural truths are examined and seeing that produced in a person's life. So the word sound, it means to be healthy. It's also a word that's used to speak of the structural integrity of a building or of steel or something along those lines. The soundness of it is critical. You don't want to be like the building. Where is it down in Florida? That, that big condo that collapsed and the whole side of it fell off and buried a couple hundred people and they died, right? There needs to be soundness or structural integrity to the beliefs and the convictions that we stand for. So when it says here they must be able by sound doctrine, that's the critical component. Um, folks, uh, <laughs> sound doctrine doesn't get enamored with speculations that don't help people in becoming more obedient to Christ. Godly elders aim their teaching at maturing people in the knowledge of God and in the need to live obediently to it. Now the word doctrine is one of our prime focuses here in this study tonight. The word doctrine means teaching. It's the same word that's translated as teaching. It includes both the doctrinal and the practical parts of scripture some people don't like the doctrinal portions of the word of god very much maybe they're bored by it i don't know i love it but uh, they, they just want to they just want what they need to have a happy marriage and to raise their children and to succeed in their business and all the different things of the physical world they just want the practical stuff well, generally People that think that way also resist the stuff that really demands holiness because practical holy living is always based on Bible doctrine. Paul's normal pattern as you study through the New Testament epistles is to clearly lay out the doctrine in the first half of the book before he moves on to the practical in the second half of the book. You can't have the one without the other. The doctrine is the foundation for it. And I would also call this to your attention that uh, you ought to keep in mind as we think about Paul's pattern there his emphasis on doctrine, that he was mainly writing to many who were illiterate slaves, the common people who largely made up the early churches. And yet he apparently thought that the believers in Rome needed to know Romans chapters 1 through 11 for their spiritual health before he got into the practical parts of chapter 12. <laughs> the reality is that great doctrines of the Bible are intensely practical. Without them, people try to build their lives with no foundation. I'll reiterate what I said at the beginning tonight. Everybody has doctrine. The question is, to what extent is their doctrine sound? We've already studied much recently on exhortation and what it is from the scriptures. Remember, exhort means to come alongside. It's the same word that, uh, it's parakaleo. It, it speaks of the same function that the Holy Spirit does in walking alongside his churches. And so um, the Holy Spirit does that and he teaches us the word of God. He helps us to comprehend the word of God. 
The exhortation that's talked about here means to draw alongside someone and implore, to entreat, to urge a person to obedience to God's word. That's the job of an elder. Paul uses the same word in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, where after commanding Timothy to preach the word, he adds, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. It implies that our hearts must be in our teaching so that people sense the urgency of these important truths. And so elders must be men of biblical understanding, of biblical conviction, of biblical obedience, of biblical exhortation. And then fifthly, elders must be men of biblical courage to confront error. This is a tough part for some people. One, I'd say it's tough for anybody. One, one writer said it this way. A pastor must have two voices. One for gathering and feeding the sheep. And another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. <laughs> the scripture supplies him with the means of doing both. Now, some people get caught up in thinking that we should always be positive. And focus on the positive. But to just teach positively is not enough. Paul says that we must also refute false teaching. We obviously, in doing that, must not be purposely offensive. Our manner in doing that must not be offensive. That's why in that verse that I just read a minute ago, um, it, it talks about, uh, let me find it here again, rebuke or exhort, reprove with all long suffering and doctrine, right? So there is the manner in which it's done, but that, that reproving and rebuking and exhorting still takes place. So we ought not to be offensive in our manner in approaching people, um, but neither should we be so timid, so nice, so hesitant, so polite, that we end up watering down or neglecting or compromising truth or never getting around to it because that certainly doesn't show love for people's souls. In the past, um, I've been warned about naming people. And I'm not going to call anybody out here from the pulpit. I'm not talking about that. But naming people in the sense of calling false teachers out from the community or, or from the world around us. I've been warned about naming churches, naming denominations in my preaching because it might be offensive. And, and, and I do realize this, that some care should be taken to ensure that we are staying strictly with the scripture in doing that. And that it's not done with an offensive spirit or a contrary spirit. But in the New Testament, I find that the apostles frequently named the names of false teachers and dangerous men. They had to be spotlighted. Those, uh, those apostles and teachers, they marked them. They labeled them. They clearly identified their doctrinal or practical errors and then used them as examples of others. Don't follow these things. I found that if I just talk in general terms when I preach or when I uh, exhort, people don't tend to get it. They might just, oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But when there's specific things that are pointed out and, and called as examples, then it's pretty impactful and people can recognize where those false doctrines go. People sometimes go out and buy the books of false teachers if we don't call them out. They listen to false teachers. They may even have respect for false teachers. In fact, some of the ones that I named that are part of the evangelicalism earlier might have kind of shocked you. I was a little bit shocked when I was reading D.L. Moody's autobiography with my family, and I found how incredibly um, pathetic he was when it came to laying aside all Bible doctrine and gathering together with everybody from Catholics to Unitarians, you name it, and trying to just have this big, uh, this big mushy feel-good movement where he lived out and ministered. It was terrible. We had to stop reading the book. It got so bad. <clears throat> so we've got to get specific at times. Now, when Paul confronted the Galatian heresy, he didn't say this. The Judaizers are good brethren. And we agree on so much. Can't we just set aside the few areas where we disagree and come together on the basis that we share in common? <laughs> no, he denounced them as preaching a false gospel. He pronounced anathema maranatha on them. That is, let them be damned. Let them be cursed by God. <laughs> Serious statement. <clears throat> 
John Gresham Macon was the professor of New Testament studies at Princeton University in the early 1900s. Um, I'm not endorsing his teaching by any means. He had some stuff that he was wrong on, but he addressed the liberalism that was permeating many churches in his circle, and he said this, men tell us that our preaching should be positive and not negative, that we can preach the truth without attacking error. But if we follow that advice, we shall have to close our Bible and desert its teachings. The New Testament is a controversial book almost from beginning to end. Every really great Christian utterance, it may almost be said, is born in controversy. It is when men have felt compelled to take a stand against error that they have risen to the really great heights in the celebration of the Bible's truth. Now, folks, here's a simple reality. When all is at peace and God's people aren't doing battle with the kingdom of Satan, that's not a good sign because it means that Satan is having his way. The truth of God's word cuts. It divides the bone from the marrow, according to the teaching of the New Testament. And that's not a particularly peaceful, comfortable process. If everything is at peace with Satan and his minions, it means that God's word is not being properly utilized. But when God's word is unleashed, and controversy is raging, hopefully not right here within our church body amongst our members, but as long as it's due to the conviction of God's word of truth, don't be discouraged by that. Take heart because something is getting done. Anyone who expects to see everything at peaceful coexistence with the world doesn't understand the real nature of the ministry of God's word. Elders must be men of courage in biblically confronting error. So last week we saw that elders must be men who build and lead God-honoring homes and who meet the Bible's standard for God-honoring character. Today we see that elders must be godly men who hold firmly and boldly teach God's word of truth. You can easily find churches that will give you nice, uplifting, positive message about, uh, messages about how to succeed in life. But such messages will do absolutely nothing but saturate you with the many winds of false doctrine that are blowing in our day. To be strong in the Lord, you must be in a church that skillfully uses the word of God to exhort in sound doctrine and refute er uh, error. And so um, may all of our elders be men of God's word. May all of our members be men and women of God's word. Let's apply ourselves to that. Let's pray.